I played through the majority of the Metroid franchise in preparation for Metroid Dread. I'd beaten two of them previously, played but not completed three others, and had never touched three before. Since Federation Force is kind of a spin-off and I'm playing through it with friends, I wasn't in a rush to beat it before Dread came out. As for Other M, while it's been the center of some re-examination and discussion, I still have no motivation to play it from everything I've seen. I did watch a long play of it though, so that's… something? Regardless, my journeys in the various suit were a great time, and now that fans have finally played Metroid Dread after all these years, our minds turn once again to the possibilities of the future. Metroid Prime 4 still looms over fans and the gaming community, shrouded in mystery. Initially revealed at E3 2017, it was later announced to be restarting production in January 2019, returning to the hands of the Prime series' original creators, Retro Studios. Since then, radio silence. The odd job listing or vaguest of concept arts here and there. It may still be years before we see Prime 4 in all its glory, but especially with Dread Out, I think we've been given more than enough fuel to ponder what this game could be like. That's what I'd like to do here. After living and breathing Metroid for months, I'd like to share my thoughts on what would make Metroid Prime 4 a game changer just like the original Prime. Before I get into what's to come, I want to provide some context with what we've already had. See, I feel it's important in this kind of discussion to establish where I'm coming from and what I personally take from the Metroid franchise. After all, I'm just me. The things I like and dislike about these games may vary wildly from yours. So I want to briefly touch on the games and clarify what the strongest and weakest elements are to me. I'll be going through in the same order that I played them, which is the chronological order of the games. I started my arm cannon adventures with one that I'd never really played before. Well, not really anyway. I played a tiny bit of the original Metroid previously on NES Online, but not nearly enough to influence any of my feelings on Zero Mission. This is a remake of the original game that shows the start of it all, Samus going to planet Zebus to stop the space pirates from using the Metroids as weapons. It also added in a stealth-focused Zero Suit escape through a space pirate mothership. When it comes to remakes that intend to replace their older, sometimes outdated counterparts, I think this is about as good as you can get. Zero Mission may be short, but nearly every second is a blast to play. It's not the most complex of Metroid games, it still feels very much like a starting point, but with its runtime, it doesn't overstay its welcome. I think the Zero Suit portion is a great, unique twist on the series as well, and I'm surprised that this is the only time we've gotten to play with it, despite how iconic it's become. Wait, do you get to do that in other M? Who, whatever, who cares? I wouldn't mind this coming back in some form, but I'll have to revisit that once I put all the pieces together. While there are other elements I can pick out as things I particularly enjoyed, the speed and ease of backtracking both from movement options and mat design, the fun variety of gameplay, I think my main takeaway from Zero Mission is how gracefully it updated the core concepts into something even better. Metroid Prime came out nearly two decades ago. Prime 3 concluded the trilogy 14 years ago. Even if we count Federation Force, it's still been like five and a half years, and that was on a handheld. The spirit of Zero Mission's renovation of the original Metroid DNA is something I think Prime 4 could benefit greatly from, if not exactly its one-to-one -one choices. And in terms of cons, they're really minute and shouldn't affect Prime 4 anyway. I think Mother Brain's boss arena is a tad annoying and clustered with stuff that can hurt you, some of the stealth sections are kinda janky, and the map design sometimes lacks contextual hints for secrets. However, basically all of those have been addressed throughout the series, so I think it's best to call this game great and move on. From here, the next few games I'll talk about are undoubtedly the most important to this discussion. Naturally, talk about the Prime games is going to take a little longer. This is where we begin Retro's series with the original Metroid Prime. Samus investigates the distress beacon, leading to a crash onto the planet of Talon 4, discovering space pirate operations with Metroids and the mysterious substance Phazon. In discovering ancient Chozo artifacts and abilities, she's able to destroy the pirate's research and cure the planet of its Phazon infection, seemingly defeating the Metroid Prime. This is the game that would prove Metroid can work in a first-person, 3D environment, and would lay the groundwork for what that means for this part of the franchise. Danger is ever-present, but the game isn't too shoot-happy, preferring that you utilize your various beams and dodging rather than completely overpowering your threats. There's platforming, puzzles, tons of backtracking with your new abilities, all lending to a heavy emphasis on exploration. This is furthered by the game's subtle lore and world-building. Unlike 2D Metroid games, Samus doesn't even have text dialogue in this, so these elements come almost entirely from scan entries. You'll learn about the Chozo, the Space Pirates, Phazon, whatever you might be wondering about, as well as tactical advantages on tougher opponents. These are what I'd consider to be the core tenets of the Prime series. Exploration, tactical combat, and subtle lore. Prime is one of the best Metroid games. I think because it had something to prove, they molded it into something truly special, and a lot of that is owed to the game's atmosphere. 
The ambiance of the world is spectacular, with each section feeling completely different, yet part of the same whole. The blend of ancient crumbling civilization, wild alien creatures and plant life, and futuristic yet industrial technology all combines into one of the most memorable Metroid locales. It also just feels, for lack of a better word, video gamey. Even while I'm getting sucked into the world, it's still a super pleasant experience that feels like it's constantly progressing and evolving. A lot of this is due to its methods of world building, as I already discussed, but another big part of it is the combat. While other Metroid games level up your starting kit, this consistently provides you with new weapons and abilities, changing the way you move and fight in the world. I think it does a pretty solid job at making sure you're using all your weapons, whether it's on doors or specific enemies, though I will say that it is still heavily reliant on super missiles for most tougher enemies, but that is what it is. This game isn't perfect of course, and it does have issues that it had to learn from later. The biggest thing I can critique about Prime is the controls. This surely stems in part from the time it was released and being released on the GameCube, but with modern shooter sensibilities, it can feel quite clunky at times. In particular, the lack of camera control in tandem with your slow floaty movement leads to moments of irritating platforming where you have no clue where you're going while getting hit from god knows where. Later games would have a fix for this, but that's probably the biggest issue this game faces in modern day playthroughs, and even then, if you can get your hands on the Wii port, then you're fine. There are other issues that don't change with a different controller though. Some bosses can be annoying, especially in their final form, with attacks that are too fast and untelegraphed to be dodged whatsoever. Backtracking early on can be tedious due to the design of areas is like Magmar Caverns and, again, your very slow speed without any additional equipment to help ease the process. And just like Zero Mission, there can be a lack of clear contextual hints for secrets. But while in Zero Mission these are mostly just upgrades you may not need, in the Prime series this frequently manifests into items needed to complete the game, such as the Chozo artifacts. Combined with the backtracking, late game searching can be a little tiresome and required some online guidance from me on my first time through. Even so, this is still a pinnacle of Metroid at its best, and despite other games fixing some some of these issues, the feeling this game fills you with is something that's going to be hard to capture in Prime 4. Metroid Prime Hunters is an odd game, but one that I have a lot of connection to. It's one of the two Metroid games I completed as a kid, and I put a ton of time into the multiplayer. Still, with the hindsight of the rest of the series, it does kind of stick out like a sore thumb. A brief sidetracking in the Prime story, Samus investigates a message involving ultimate power in the Olympic Cluster traversing multiple planets and fighting off other bounty hunters. There's the genetically engineered Kandan, Spire the last of the Diamonds, Noxus from the monk race of Vozon trying to protect the universe, Trace who is searching for planets for the Kirken race to invade as the rite of passage, Weevil, a cybernetically altered space pirate nearly killed by Samus on Zebus, and Silex. Not much is known about Silex outside of his hatred for Samus and the Federation, and that at this time he's the most important of these opposing hunters, which I'll get to later. I spend a chunk of time on these hunters because they're kind of the most interesting part of the game. Otherwise, you're just traveling between these planets to get artifacts and weapons before defeating a creature called Gorea and bringing peace to the system. So here's the thing. Much to my childhood's surprise, this is the weakest Metroid game. Let me go over what it does right first, as it does bring some very interesting things to the table. For one, I think the controls are better for platforming and combat. They're not the best the series has done, but they're a step up from Prime. It's also not very long, though here it's more about not prolonging the worst aspects instead of highlighting the good ones like in Zero Mission. I like that you start fairly well armed and don't start from scratch, planet hopping and teleporters feel pretty good but are done better later, and scanning feels a little more manageable with less instances of needing to scan the same thing three times. However, the clear high point of the game are the other hunters and their weapons. As fun as gigantic monstrous bosses can be, it can be really fun to fight something in your own scale, something that navigates the arena in a similar way to you instead of feeling like part of the arena. Plus, these hunters bring with them unique weapons that really stand out in the series. While you don't need them for a ton of puzzles, and there's only a few times where they feel needed for a specific job, I still love how unique they are and how much they change the way you fight, especially as the other hunters in multiplayer. The Vault Driver with consistent pressure and visual disruption, the magma creating dangerous spots of terrain, the Judicator as this game's ice beam, the Battle Hammer with a big blast radius punishing those hiding around corners, the Imperialist as a deadly pinpoint sniper, and the Shock Coil leeching health from enemies who can't get away. I think having a variety of new weapons like this is great, and it's even better when we get to use the other hunters in multiplayer with their own morph ball forms as well. But this game is lowest on the list for a reason. As linear as some of the other games can be, this is basically just an action game. You walk through each area twice, getting a little further the second time before an escape sequence kicks you out every single time. It's much less exciting than basically every other Metroid environment. 
The beams don't feel like they get a lot of use despite how cool they are. Boss fights still emphasize your slow movement, meaning sometimes you have no option but to get hit. And overall, this is just an extremely stripped down game without a real sense of growth or progression. Staples like the Super Missile and Power Bomb are completely absent, with nothing replacing them, meaning the world feels so much less alive and interesting. It doesn't really succeed at any of the ten poles of Prime. The environment is fine, but not particularly engaging. The combat and use of beams is very bare bones, and the actual text of scans lacks any real personality. In fact, while I'm complaining, I'm going to use this to talk about scanning as a whole. While it does lend itself to great world building, provides cute little memorable moments like space pirates getting in trouble for Metroid pets and killing themselves trying to figure out how the Morph Ball works, and using visors for puzzles and combat, I think the approach to scanning needs an update. It's all well and good when you're just walking around exploring, but especially as the game gets faster and more tense and puts you against extremely dangerous enemies, the scanning can be a huge chore and momentum killer. So in Hunters, which is already more linear and quicker in general, the inclusion of scans with uninteresting dialogue is about as bad as the function gets. Don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed this game, but as we consider what Prime 4 could be, there's not much here that other games haven't done better. Except these guys. I'm not going to forget about them. Especially you. Prime 2 picks back up with the Phazon storyline. Kind of. Okay, so while I was writing this, I kind of realized I had no clue how this substantially tied into anything. So I guess let's go right into my complaints with this game first. The game revolves around the planet of Aether, its dark counterpart, and the Luminoth who ask for your aid to heal the split world. This entire setup feels video gamey in a bad way, unlike Prime. In this, you meet a generic alien race and do a generic key hunt through environments mostly similar to the original. And sprinkled throughout is all the phase on stuff that we actually have a connection to. But it's mostly incidental that it's happening at the same time. Dark Samus exists now as a reborn form of the Metroid Prime and is here siphoning phase on from the pirates' operations and the phase on that has been infecting the planet. We see her a handful of times, and it's always very isolated. It doesn't feel like she's this chaotic entity destroying everything regardless of allegiance. She's just another enemy. Along with the game's length and fairly samey environments, this leads to the game feeling overly long with a final backtrack that I refuse to do without just looking up the locations. Definitely a lower tier Metroid game for me. There are some good elements at play here, outweighed by the bad, but nonetheless good and worth mentioning. It's not that I disliked playing any of these games, just that some put the pieces together in a worse puzzle. I like that scans are larger, bright blocks of color now, making it clearer what is needed, but it was done better in the next game. While not exactly exciting in aesthetic, the design of the world is pretty solid. There's a much better layout of elevators, and the world feels a lot less segmented than Talon. I especially like when you initially find the Space Pirate facilities and the Sanctuary Fortress. Maybe it was because the other sections weren't interesting to me, but this final main area and its unique robotic enemies with fun attack patterns and interesting effects was very exciting, a much needed breath of fresh air. I also think the pacing of unlocks is good, and in practice the shorter little objectives with the keys does help the flow of the game, even if I don't like them on the whole. Even so, there's a few things that really sour my experience. I've mentioned some like the slow pace and generic environments, and there's other things like the dark beam being less useful than light, ammo being annoying, and map rooms being more frequent but only giving you small chunks of the map. I much prefer finding THE map room and getting your bearings on the whole region. But my biggest complaint far and away are the boss fights. Simply put, these are the worst boss fights in Metroid. They're more memorable than many in Prime, I'll give them that, but with all but a few, it's for a bad reason. They're either simple and tedious with a ludicrous bar of health or small hitboxes that make it last forever, or completely unforgiving in the most frustrating way. I could talk about the Boost Guardian or the Emperor Ing, but it all culminated for me with the Spider Guardian. This is, hands down, the worst boss in Metroid. While developing the game, it was said that if they couldn't get the Morph Ball to work, the game wouldn't work. Well, it don't work, fam. You get hit for ridiculous damage, it's hard to properly navigate, the save point is so far away if you die, and the ending. Oh god, the ending. You need to make pixel perfect bomb jumps and have the absolute perfect momentum to sit at the top of hills to land in the bomb slot three times. If I wasn't absolutely dedicated to beating these games, I might have stopped there. It also didn't help that the first time I actually beat it, I died before I could get to the next save station. It's a fine game at the end of the day, but I have no desire to go back and play this one again. And there's a very small list of things from it to be brought into Prime 4. Going straight from Prime 2 to this, I was starting to feel burnout and worried I'd really get dragged down by jumping right into Prime 3. 
but oddly enough, the very changes that make fans hesitate about Prime 3 are what snapped me out of my funk and kept me engaged. Samus and fellow bounty hunters Rundus, Gore, and Gandreda are brought in to heal an AI network from a space pirate virus before a huge assault makes everything go awry. They stop a Phazon meteor from hitting the planet Norion, but are attacked by Dark Samus and infected with Phazon. While Samus is able to harness this as a weapon, it begins slowly corrupting and killing her, having already made the other hunters go mad under Dark Samus' influence. She goes to the planets they were assigned to and rids them of Phazon, unfortunately defeating the insane hunters in the process, before eventually finding Phaze, the source of Phazon in the galaxy. The Federation stages an all-out assault on the pirates as Samus heads to the planet, defeats Dark Samus, and rids the universe of Phazon once and for all. This game has its issues, which of course I'll get into, but I was honestly surprised how much I enjoyed it. It kept me interested the entire time, and even if it's not as pure Metroid or Metroid Prime as others, it's a straight up highly enjoyable game. First things first, the controls in this game are excellent. I haven't played the Prime Trilogy on Wii, but if they feel like this, they'd probably be even higher in my rankings. It keeps the basic feel of Metroid Prime movement and combat, most importantly keeping the lock-on mechanic, but the enhanced accuracy of the Wiimote leads to tons of interesting puzzles in combat. Even if I get tired of doing physical motions like the grapple lasso to pull a shield off, the game feels great to play. It has pretty solid pacing, I was consistently engaged in what was developing in the story, and I like this characterization of Samus a decent bit. You can feel her sadness and anger about the loss of the other hunters, and can really tell how much the Phazon is affecting her despite pushing forward. I also love that you get to be in the ship and control it a little, though I'd like even more. Beyond that, I think that getting new equipment and the key hunting s aspects are motivated way better by unlocking whole new areas, and enemy encounters and challenges feel more varied. The bosses are pretty strong in this in the grand scheme of Metroid as well, especially the other hunters with some dynamic environments. Honestly, the main thing dragging this game down that most people agree on is the narrative, which unfortunately is a big part of this game as it's much more story heavy than the previous titles. It's not quite that the game itself is painfully linear, I did find myself backtracking from planet to planet at interesting times, and this game's version of the endgame collectible hunt is more optional and fairly enjoyable, but there's never really a moment where you don't feel like you're being guided somewhere either by the Federation or the Aurora units constantly talking to you. This also lends to equipment feeling a bit linear as well, and along with the control scheme, your arsenal feels toned down in this. Because of the limitations of the Wii mode, it takes a more 2D Metroid approach, simply upgrading your beam and missiles instead of giving you a variety. It's not terrible, the game is designed well around it, but it does lose out on that unique element of Prime. Oh, and you don't really get to first-hand pilot your ship for anything cool, despite things like missile upgrades and using it to further your progression. I still enjoyed this game much more than expected, and even if it sacrificed some of its Metroid Prime spirit, I think the big cinematic feel of the game is a good ending to the trilogy. And with some of its gameplay choices, it's our closest imaginable starting point to Prime 4. From here on out, it's back to 2D. Samus Returns is a remake of Metroid 2 Return of Samus made by Mercury Steam, the team behind Metroid Dread. Phazon may be gone, not that it's ever acknowledged in this hemisphere of Metroid, but the Metroid are still a galactic threat, and Samus is sent to their homeworld SR388 to completely eradicate them. That's pretty much all the setup you get. Have fun with the genocide! You work your way through the world, discover a little bit more about the Chozo, and eventually wipe all of the Metroid out except for one, a baby Metroid who imprints on you and comes along for the ride. I don't have a ton to say about this game that I won't say tenfold about Dread, so I'll keep this short to move things along. I like Sam's Returns, it's not the best, but it's a lot of fun. I think the controls were better than ever up to this point, it's got a good combination of new and old tools, and thematically I like Samus starting to form this tougher exterior, even if some would say she was too tough here, or the game lost its isolated, desperate edge from other titles. Its weaker points are in its world and enemies. While Samus Returns had wonderful gameplay updates, they were kind of wasted on this game. The map is very samey and bland, only asking you to walk straight through, then once more at the end for completion, and the enemies don't really change much after the first few sections. Like I said, it's a fun game, there just isn't much here that I want to highlight that I also won't discuss with Dread. Super Metroid picks up almost immediately after Samus returns, with the baby Metroid being delivered to some instantly doomed scientists when Ridley swoops in and steals it. Actually, I haven't really covered Ridley up to this point, so in short, 
Ridley is the cause of every problem in Samus's life. He kills her family when she's a child, leaving her to be raised by the Chozo who give her the suit. He leads the Space Pirates who then raid the Federation stealing Metroids in the first game, is defeated, but finds ways to antagonize Samus throughout the series while he's being rebuilt, until he's finally back in action here, stealing the last Metroid and taking it to Zebus because it worked so well the last time. Samus returns to Zebus, guns her way through once again, kills the real Ridley and Mother Brain for good, and destroys the entire planet, ending the Metroid threat. Or so she thinks. Okay, so hear me out. I didn't really love Super Metroid all that much. Now, hold on, don't leave. I know it's basically heresy for a Metroid fan to say this. I intend to be completely fair to the game, but that means fair both ways. I'd never played this game before, and I came in knowing it was held in high regard, expecting it to be great. Let me address some of the key things people praise about the game. Its influence, the map design, and the atmosphere. For its influence, I mean, yeah, I can see it. I can tell what an impact this game had on gaming in general, but also the Metroid franchise specifically. Whether it's things like the X-ray visor, the way specific tools are used, certain design and secret elements of the map, enemies, whatever you pick, you can probably find it in another Metroid game. This game is an example of pure Metroid DNA. However, I don't necessarily count that as a good or bad thing. Like, sure, it's good when other games build on the good concepts of this game, but it's Super Metroid as a singular experience that is more important to me. Its map is great, that's probably the highest I could praise it. It's one of the best Metroid maps in its interconnectivity, sneakily bleeding into other sections in really fun ways. As for the atmosphere, I don't know, I think I just missed out on being properly affected by it. Parts like the crashed ship or ruins of the facility made by your hand in the first game are really cool, but it just feels like any other Super Nintendo game to me, and lacks the fullness later technology could provide. But those don't really support my initial negativity. I did have fun with it after all, I intend to try it again, and there's a lot to admire about the game. Except the controls. Yeah, this seems to be the one thing most people agree is a rougher spot, and for me, it critically hindered the experience. Especially because I played chronologically, meaning I got to experience Zero Mission and Samus Returns before this, it was painful. Your overall movement has a weird momentum, platforming can be imprecise, aiming can take a moment of thought even with rebinding the controls on SNES Online, and things like wall jumping or moving through liquid made me want to stop playing immediately. I'm more than willing to admit this might mostly be a me thing, because because I missed out on most of these big generational games as a kid, going back to them today feels like hopping around with my legs tied together. I can admire what these games do, appreciate their impact in gaming history, and still have a fun time with them. But a game has to feel good to play to get my full seal of approval, and modern game design just does it better for me. There's plenty of parts of this game I'd like to see in Prime 4's construction, and other smaller grievances like not liking the boss fights, but in the end, the most important thing for me coming from Super is hoping Prime 4 is able to fully modernize its controls. I don't want it to feel archaic with the designs of the past. Okay, you're still here after I complained about Super Metroid on the internet? Cool, let's move on to a less controversial take. Fusion takes place after Super Metroid, and Other M, with Samus escorting a Federation research mission to a Metroid-less SR388. However, what she finds is much worse. The X. These organisms infect and duplicate their hosts, spreading even more rapidly than Metroids, and pose a huge threat to the galaxy. After being infected, Samus crashes her ship and is nearly killed were it not for a vaccine with the last of the Metroid DNA from the baby Metroid, making Samus permanently part Metroid. After she recovers, being physically altered by the surgery, she's sent to a station that was researching and taken over by the X. In trying to resolve the situation via the commands of the Federation, she discovers two horrifying things. X-clones of herself formed from pieces of her old armor, and secret research on Metroids being conducted by the Federation. This game also introduces Adam, a companion AI based on the consciousness of her old CEO. Initially strictly robotic in his order, Samus is able to bring out some of his personality and gets him to trust her to stop both of these potentially cataclysmic forces. She puts the facility on a collision course with SR-388, destroying the planet and any traces of Metroids and X. Again, so she thinks. I always enjoy playing Fusion, but it's fairly middle ground on my list and is somewhat divisive within the fanbase. Much like Prime 3, Fusion foregoes deep exploration for linearity in service of a front and center narrative. You're guided around by Adam, pop in and out of tighter closed off sections of the ship, and have your mission broken up in chunks by his orders as the situation evolves. A lot of what I could praise is covered better by other entries, like controls and story, as are things I could criticize like linearity and the occasional frustrating boss battle. 
I'd say what I want Prime 4 to take from Fusion the most is its willingness to shake up the status quo. Samus is permanently changed. She's more on the outs with the Federation than ever, new threats are established, and you don't even fight Ridley. You fight a clone of them. I don't want Metroid to fall into the same old routine, so I hope they make some of those more ambitious narrative choices. Which brings us to Metroid Dread, the latest entry and a direct continuation of Fusion. The Federation receives a mysterious transmission showing ex-parasites alive on a planet called ZDR. After their Emmy drones are sent and go missing, Samus accepts the mission to ensure any X are eliminated and figure out what happened to the Emmy. Shortly after arriving, she's attacked by a Ravenbeak, a Chozo warrior who killed the majority of the other Chozo that sealed the Metroids away on 388, and lured Samus here to extract her Metroid DNA to use its power to rule the galaxy. We learn about his warrior tribe, the Malkin, as well as the scientific Toha tribe with Quiet Robe, aiding her before being killed. Blowing up plants has worked so well in the past, so once again she is able to make her way through the world and confront Ravenbeak. Meanwhile, after their first encounter, her Metroid DNA began to take over, allowing her to use their parasitic powers over time. During her final battle, it completely envelops her, making her a full Metroid hybrid and helping her defeat Ravenbeak. Before escaping, an X with Quiet Robe's memories allows itself to be absorbed by her, returning her to a more normal state before she flies away, finally destroying the X once and for all, maybe probably. If you've watched my review of Metroid Dread in my October 2022 episode of my review show, you'll know that I love this game and naturally would like to see a lot of its spirit in Prime 4. Samus's movement is fluid and driven, your array of tools and weapons is perfectly implemented, and traveling the world and finding secrets has never been more engaging. It similarly makes big story moves like Fusion, fully realizing the Metroid aspect of Samus, showing us living Chozo, and creating a real blank slate by the end, closing this chapter of Samus's story really the only one we've known so far. I really can't think of much I specifically don't want Retro to take note of here. If I'm honest, I think they've had the heat turned up on them even more than before to deliver. I guess maybe I could do without narrative drive from Adam, even if it's less than Fusion, we saw what something like that is like in Prime 3 and I wasn't a fan. Otherwise, I don't know, as you might have guessed this is my favorite Metroid game. I think Prime 4 could learn a lot from this in truly modernizing Prime, and the only things I'd want them to avoid are basically just core differences between 2D and 3D gameplay. So now that we've taken a detour and dissected the Metroid franchise so far, let's see what ingredients we have and how we can combine them. Hello, and welcome to Making Metroid Prime 4. Today we'll be combining elements of all the other Metroid dishes into something brand new. With 9 Metroid games analyzed, it's time to take the individual pieces of things I liked and didn't like and find the ideal construction of Metroid Prime 4. As an easy guide, here are the elements I've pulled out from the other games, and for the sake of ease let's turn these negatives into positives for one cohesive list. Let's go even further and split things into gameplay, world, and story. So naturally, just like with any recipe, we're going to start with our basic ingredients. We'll begin with the core functionality of gameplay, as it's how we'll be spending all of our time interacting with this game. Even if other elements are just okay, if the game feels amazing to play, it'll lift up everything around it. The most forefront challenge here comes from modernizing Metroid Prime's gameplay without losing its intent. In recent years, there's been a fresh wave of great feeling first person shooters implementing new mainstay mechanics, and for me they all come together in Doom Eternal. Now, Doom Eternal and Metroid Prime are massively different games at their core, with nearly opposite goals. Doom Eternal wants to make you feel powerful and unstoppable, keeping you on your toes, while Metroid Prime is slower, more deliberate, and has tons of emphasis on aspects outside of combat. By no means do I intend to alter what makes Prime Prime, but some things just feel too good to pass up on and aren't total strangers to the Metroid franchise. For starters, I'd want to give Samus a basic increase of her walking speed. Not too fast, again, not going full Doom here, but there are plenty of moments in Prime spent sauntering through long corridors you've already cleared of secrets over and over again that can really slow things down. Plus, in 2D, Samus has never really felt slow, especially in Samus Returns and Dread. An overall higher level of movement speed will make traversal less tedious and make combat more interesting. Secondly, ledge grabbing and mantling will become a basic movement option. You can call it the power grip if you want to keep to the older games, but this has become commonplace not only in 2D Metroid, but in most FPS games in recent years. We've even seen it in Prime before with Prime 3, though it was very limited there. Again, this helps both ease of exploration and variety of combat, opening up more verticality to the battles. With that established, I want to talk control schemes before going forward. We've seen Prime on a GameCube controller, with a Wiimote and Nunchuck, and on the DS consoles, 
But this is the first time we'll see the series with something like the Pro Controller, a much more modern design that I intend to use to its fullest. To start simple with standard FPS fare, left stick will be movement, right stick will be aiming and camera control, B will be jump, and ZR will be firing your arm cannon. You'll also have gyro controls as an option, feeling like a mix of standard shooter and Prime 3 where when you're specifically locked on you can further specify your targeting, otherwise that's just done with the right stick. Nothing too surprising there, now let's put the other most important elements of Prime in. The right side will continue to be weapons focused, with R being your missiles. The left side will be visually focused, with ZL being your lock on, and L scanning with whatever secondary visor you have equipped. For the rest of the face buttons, A will be your dash. I promise it's not just Doom, this isn't going to be some crazy tracer dash or even as good as Doom Slayers. This is a single dash with a slightly longer cooldown than Dread, either providing a helpful boost forward for platforming or a better strafing option in combat. I've always felt that your strafe in the Prime games frequently doesn't get the job done, primarily with bosses that rush you down. So this aims to aid in your defensive movement, set up more interesting map design, and allow you to use both jump and strafe in really tough fights, whereas B was both jump and strafe in the older Primes. X will transform you into the Morph Ball, feeling like one of the more isolated buttons since it's not one of the quickest options you'll need, and Y will be a melee attack, directly inspired by Samus Returns and Dread. I do want to de-emphasize it a little more than those games though, as I know it's not an aspect everyone is in love with. It'll be a little more situational, primarily to prevent big attacks or shove smaller enemies away without the huge damage boost after or too long of a stun time. There will be other uses for this melee attack, but I'll touch on those later. Then we get to the less active elements in your control. Like any sane game, the plus button will be the pause button, and minus will open your map. I've also kind of isolated combat to the right and analysis to the left here, just like the triggers. The pause menu will automatically show you your inventory, displaying the current loadout and abilities of your suit. You'll also be able to view item pickups like keys, button mapping and accessibility options, please god Nintendo get better at that, save points, and exit the game. The plus button is dedicated to stuff you use and the way you play the game. Meanwhile, Minus hosts all of your info on the world, showing you the map of the world you're on now, all maps and discovered areas thus far, and any scan data whether whether it be on enemies or lore. Finally, we come to the D-pad. This is your equipment hub and how you'll quickly change your arsenal for whatever you may need. Pressing the right will switch to the next beam, while holding will let you directly select with the right stick. Left will work the same but with your missiles, and up with your visors. Double tapping any of these would return them to the default. Finally, down will be your scan pulse. You'll have to find this later into the game, but it will work similarly to the Mercury Steam game, scanning the surrounding area and highlighting potential secrets. I think these changes create a lot of opportunities and sharpen up some of the previous designs. The changes to scanning and your movement options are what I'm most hopeful to see. As I've said, scanning often felt like a chore throughout the Prime series, an unnecessary slowdown and diversion particularly in the middle of a fight. Along with some other changes, I think eliminating the need to fully switch to the scan visor instead switching it on and off will help it fit into gameplay more. As for combat, Prime's pre-established designs meld kind of perfectly with a fresh control scheme. I've been playing FPS games on a controller for a while now, and in hairy situations it can still be tough to properly jump and spin and shoot all at once. It's a benefit that keyboard and mouse players have always had. However, with Prime's lock-on mechanic, jumping and dashing to dodge attacks and reposition can work seamlessly without losing your target. So that's something like what I'd want to see in Prime 4, and this large assortment of options plays into another thing I really think is necessary in Prime 4. Not starting from scratch. For the love of god, hasn't Samus been through enough? Does she have to lose all of her gear again? I want there to be new equipment and upgrades throughout the game of course, but do we really need to lock missiles and the morph ball away until later in the game? Gameplay wise, we already know what to expect from the basic Metroid toolkit, and thematically I want this to be a Samus who's already prepared and gets even stronger. Alongside where I want the story to take place, I think giving you most of the iconic Samus moveset from the start, but giving you plenty of time to get to know it works best. That said, here is what I want you to start with. The Various Suit, the Power Beam and Charge Beam, Basic Missiles, the Morph Ball and Basic Bomb, the Scan Visor, and the Grapple Beam. Just like the other Primes, the Grapple Beam won't be a selectable beam, it'll just become the default firing option when locking onto a Grapple Point. I want you to really feel like Samus in this game, and get to know your suit and equipment as part of yourself. Now, it could work to have smaller sections that strip things down to the bare essentials. There could be plenty of narrative reasons for this, but I'm all for Prime 4 having smaller one-off sections that drastically change the gameplay, such as bringing back Zero Suit Samus. A first-person stealth-focused section could be super cool and help lean into the tension of things like the series' alien inspiration. Here you would have higher mobility but only a jump, 
melee, extremely limited health, and some kind of basic weapon like a stun gun or a simple blaster until you find your suit. Huh, yeah, I guess like that. In a similar vein, I want to bring back more in-depth ship usage as touched on in Prime 3. I want it to be more than a spruced up teleporter between locations, I want there to be times where you actually pilot it. Like, look how cool this feels in the intro to Dread. That could be you. Whether it be avoiding asteroids to prevent damaging your ship or stumbling into a dogfight as you're chased by another bounty hunter, I want there to be situations or missions where you have to step even more into Samus' clunky boots, even if it's something one-offy like the ship mission of Halo Reach. You could also use the advanced features of your ship similar to Prime 3 with the missiles and heavy duty grapple. There's also some smaller changes I want to see. I hope Prime 4 makes sure to vary what is keeping you from exploring instead of relying solely on beams, mixing in keys or locks, or dynamically altered environments like Dread. I want to see a healthy use of non-loading screen elevators, quick teleporters, your ship, and map markers to encourage and ease backtracking. I also really want things like the charge beam change so that you don't fire that one tiny little shot before charging. It's not that big a deal, but it's always kind of bothered me, and you can for sure change it to not fire until the button is released. These have all been things we've seen more or less, even if they're expanded concepts or new ways to use certain things, and that's very much what I want Prime 4 to be. A mix of new and old. That in mind, let's close out this section talking about your upgrades and arsenal. What will we be using the D-pad for? Let's find out. First, some of the more basic movement staples. You'll find your space jump providing a double jump, screw attack later in the game, spring ball and boost ball allowing your jump and dash to work in morph ball form, and the speed booster. This would be the first time we really see this move in Prime as used in the 2D Metroids, not only enhancing your speed and dash distance, but giving you a full on charge shine spark style by holding A and tapping again. This would fire you forward wherever you're looking and I think momentarily change to a third person perspective similar to the shift to morph ball. I'm not sure what will feel best in practice. Moving on to your suits and visors before we get into all the weapons fun. Looking at the suits, there are very few that are consistent throughout the series except for the Varia and Gravity suits, and I don't really want to use the Gravity suit again to keep things fresh and not require another water level. Otherwise, it's always very situational like the Phazon or Dark and Light suits. Therefore, it's a little hard to discuss possible suits without going into the environments, but there's some options. A basic protection upgrade for environments more extreme than the Varia suit can handle would make sense. Not unlike the Phazon suit, Dark suit, or the Acid Shield unit. From there, there's some scattershot ideas that could all be interesting depending on the environments calling for them. There's something more basic like a flight suit with a short range jetpack, similar to the gravity boost in Prime 2, or something even crazier. You could have a ghost suit, making you intangible during your dash, or even going invisible like Trace or the Phantom Cloak for a stealth based challenge. Or a spider suit, holding B to cling to magnetic surfaces like the Spider Ball and completely changing the axis you're playing on to really open up secret locations. There is another option here. Instead of finding full suits, you could instead find units. The shield unit, gravity unit, ghost unit, spider unit, you get it. This would change your appearance much less without some weird excuse as to why your whole suit changes, and allows you to swap the units out as needed, adding another layer to gameplay. Actually, I like that more and I'm too lazy to rewrite this chunk of the script. So that's what we're going to do. In this case, I'm moving scan poles to be a scan visor enhancement and allow you to swap units with down on the D-pad. As for visors, we've already discussed your scan visor, downloading information on enemies, environments, and lore. It would scan even faster than before and would allow you to move in slow motion while reading the pertinent info. I'd like scans of enemies to go a step further, visually indicating weak points or weapon weaknesses with full text info off to the side with kind of a mech -y Iron Man feel. Text information would be front and center for exploration, while these changes would immerse you in fighting a Samus even further. With the scan pulse update you'd find later in the game, you could double tap scan to activate a sweep of the room to highlight secrets and destructible terrain. I think the other main returning visor should be the X-ray visor. This would combine aspects of the X-ray scope, thermal visor, and echo visor in its purpose. Using the X-ray visor, you could track invisible enemies and platforms and peer through walls or armor. Other than those, I think it goes back to the situational use issue of the suits or units where it would all depend on the specific demands of the game. Something like a low light visor for exceedingly dark areas, or a hack visor that would interface with advanced technology and locks instead of the scan visor to split some of the workload and declutter your scan locks down to only the most interesting scan data. Now let's cover all the weapons, your beams, missiles, and bombs. Starting with the Morph Ball, which will remain mostly the same. You'd start with a basic bomb and find an upgrade for the Cross Bomb. This was a huge time saver in Dread and would be a great mid-game find in Prime 4. And of course you would find the Power Bomb in the late game, bound to the R button by default. 
For the missiles, I want to keep everything explosive and big damage, but have a variety of approaches. You'll start with the basic missiles, and probably find the ice missiles early on. Because of where I want the story to go, we'll be sticking to ice missiles instead of the ice beam, and it will function the same, freezing enemies and certain terrain hit by the blast. Also returning would be the Seeker missiles. Small and weak, but locking onto multiple targets at the same time by holding R, letting you decide between working on multiple assailants or critically hindering tougher enemies by focusing weak points. And the new Static missile, exploding with a cloud of electricity, stunning enemies, and doing huge damage to mechanical foes. Each specialized missile is weaker than the regular missile, but obviously have their own benefits against individual enemies or larger groups. And for the beams, I want to keep them pretty varied not only against specific enemies, but also with pure combat utility. You'd have your normal power and charge beam, the wave beam acting as it does in other Metroid games, passing through objects and hitting multiple enemies but being weaker, the plasma beam functioning as a mix of the plasma beam from Prime and Trace's Imperialist Sniper, and the shock beam, similar to the original shock coil, or a short range massive damage option. This does lead leave us with a tricky problem to solve. I made missiles more like beams in Prime 4 because I didn't like that ice missiles completely replaced normal missiles and wanted the option to switch, and had to keep ice missiles based on plot necessity. However, I backed myself into a corner when it came to the super missile. It's a series staple, and I really like how Prime 1 and 2 handled it, having it be a combo attack with the charge beam and missile, and giving each beam their own special super missile. It's changed frequently over the years though, sometimes being its own attack with separate missile ammo, other times being a total upgrade replacing regular missiles. With that in mind, I've decided that super missiles will function as a charge attack upgrade for each missile by holding R. Your standard missile gives you the super missile, ice missiles would become the ice spreader from Prime with a larger radius, seeker missiles become the flare cloud by holding your lock on longer, exploding with bursts of phosphorus burning anyone moving through the clouds, and static missiles become the polarity bomb, magnetically drawing enemies into a vortex of electricity. By doing this, we also free up an opportunity for beam upgrades to be really unique as well, finding charge variants instead of super missiles. Your power beam becomes a charge beam, while the wave beam could change into the spacer beam shooting a wide wave of energy, the plasma beam changes into the disintegration beam completely vaporizing enemies at a certain point, and the shock beam charges into the shock coil, sharing its name with the original but functioning as a mix of that and the wave buster, latching a powerful beam onto one enemy that quickly drains health, absorbing some for yourself. This is probably the best balance of keeping unique gameplay options while not making the player overthink things when it isn't necessary, not worrying about something like 16 beam and missile combinations for super missiles. When all is said and done, that's something like 3 movement unlocks, 4 suit unlocks, 3 or 4 visors depending on how scan pulse is treated, 2 morph ball bomb unlocks, 7 missile unlocks, and 6 beam unlocks. Of course not counting other upgrades like missile expansions, energy tanks, ship upgrades, and more. So that is what I think it could be like to control Samus in Prime 4. A mix of new and old, combining the coolest concepts of the franchise with a few new ones, modernizing the feel of gameplay and control scheme, and making you feel as much like you're the one in the suit as possible. So now that we have our base ready, let's put it to use and get cooking. While the gameplay may be arguably the most important part of Prime 4 as a game, the world you'll be using it in may be the most important part to keeping the player engaged and making your tools feel useful. This includes the literal worlds you'll be traveling, along with the creatures and enemies within. This section will be a little more broad ideas over specific level design, for ease of getting the general vibe across and due to lack of ideal visual example. In no particular order, I'm going to spitball some ideas I want to see guiding this game's map design. Firstly, I want to make sure secrets are contextually clear even without tools like the scan poles and x-ray visor. Prime sometimes made sure to do this, but other times lacked visual cues. Dread was probably strongest in this regard for me, with cracks, enemies, lighting, a variety of things pointing you towards points of interest. I also don't want log entries to have too much of a personality, if that makes any sense. Not in terms of the writers, I loved getting Space Pirates perspectives on events and things like that, but the way your computer would kind of editorialize certain elements was kind of weird. Maybe if this game uses Adam as its hint feature, highlighting certain important sections as if to say, Hey, pay attention to this, dumbass then that might work since he has more of a defined personality, but that would have to be a choice made by you to have him assist. I also want logs left open for you to infer more, because I want the scan visor to not only be used as it has been before, but also to enhance the mystery of the story. I'd really like there to be an opportunity to use the scan visor in more of a detective way, noticing weapon fire markings on the walls or certain ways something was destroyed to put together what's going on for yourself. There's a couple moments like this with Prime 3 coming to mind before you find the Metroids, but it basically basically beat you over the head with it. Moving into the actual map, the areas you'll be playing in, I want it to be bigger than ever giving you tons 
to explore, but reasonable ways to navigate with rails, elevators, teleporters, and your ship providing tons of interconnectivity. However, some sections being their own contained challenges with functionality affecting just that room would also be great, fitting in as pieces to that larger framework. These could be puzzles, mini bosses, areas that change other parts of the map's accessibility, things like that. I also want to make sure the rooms are big enough to account for your newly enhanced speed, but not too bad where it feels padded and pointless. And even without your influence, I want parts of the map to change over time, either through environmental changes or enemy actions. Things like that could really make you feel isolated and fighting against the world itself while also encouraging varied exploration. Possibly most important, I want these different areas to feel distinct. A problem I've always felt present in the Prime series is the sameness of the locales even across different games. There's lots of desaturated browns and tans and grays, with some sections of desaturated green, at most a lava or ice section that nearly feels out of place. I won't pretend like it's not a tough balance to strike for sure, it's a hard task to make places feel cohesive while not being like Star Wars and having the lava planet, the ice planet, the desert planet. But we see such variety even in our own boring planet and we don't even have giant lava worms. I hope. Just make sure things like climate, natural hazards, and lighting changes all feel natural while gluing the world together with architecture and wildlife, making you know for sure you're in a certain area compared to another. Dread did this really well with the color and vibrance of each section. But what about that wildlife? What kind of enemies might we see in this game? Well, I'm no creature designer, so I really won't cover in-depth designs and mechanics, but what I will focus on is variety and evolution. Something I've noticed throughout much of the Metroid franchise is it tends to reuse enemy mechanics with a slight reskin, with Samus Returns being one of the more egregious offenders. Even some of the primes in Dread commit this sin. Like, let's see all the different ways we can do a group of small insects or a flying enemy. It's basically trying to find more and more ridiculous synonyms to say the exact same thing. Or in other words, what I do in this channel. Don't think of these as just certain enemy types. Think about why that creature is in a certain environment, how it would move, how it would look, how it would attack. I want this world to feel alive and have enemy encounters change over the course of the game. Maybe an enemy physically changes, making it more dangerous with new attacks, or maybe something else takes over its environment, removing it from the equation in favor of a new challenge. A big task here will also be making memorable, unique boss fights. This is another area Metroid can struggle in, but not fatally so. If you put all the best bosses of Metroid into one game, you'd have a kick-ass experience, so that's basically what I want to do. Have a huge variety in scale, attack patterns, ways you have to fight it, and construction of the arena. With my control changes, I want to see some bosses take advantage of the new verticality possible as well, having different layers that you have to move between to stay safe, like many 2D Metroid encounters. Lastly, I want to talk about the order in which you'll discover the world. This will tie into my next section, but first and foremost, I want the game to start a little linear and then go full open metroidvania letting you tackle the mission in a hundred different ways there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in this game new changes being made to the formula as well as series mainstays that new players might have to learn for the first time i think only giving you a few places to go a few things to do at the beginning will serve to set up the world and help you get acclimated with each section serving to teach you about a certain aspect of the gameplay then once you're ready to go the game puts you right in the middle of it setting you free to explore everything yourself backtrack and discover secrets and new abilities on your own personal path. I don't have as much to talk about in this section that won't feel a little hollow without proper context, so let's move on to the final part of this equation. Now that everything is cooking together nicely, let's give it some spice to add some kick and make it a lasting memory. What do you mean this isn't where we season the food? All right, now this is something we can all dig into. I almost feel the most confident discussing this. It's not just me playing dream game designer making up control schemes and weapons, it's looking at the whole of Metroid canon and figuring out where Prime 4 should take it. This will set the course for the rest of the story developments. So to start at the start, when does this game take place? Let's take out the timeline and see what kind of real estate we're working with. I guess you could technically say that there's room for a prequel before Zero Mission, focusing on her time bounty hunting and leading up to the events of the original game, but I'm gonna shoot that one down right away. It's called Zero Mission for a reason, and I think the beginning should remain the beginning. Where things start to get interesting though is the next space, between Zero Mission and Samus Returns. This is canonically a pretty sizable gap, as it's where the entirety of the Prime games take place. A lot of fans seem to think this is where it'll be happening, just following in line with the rest of the series. This would imply that Prime 4 would be following Federation Force, 
lending even more credence to the decision to have Samus wipe out every Metroid in Samus Returns. Personally, I'm not vibing with it. For one, it just feels like bloating an already chunky and significant portion of the canon to imply even more critically important stuff happened between Metroid 1 and 2. Furthermore, I don't really think the galaxy needs any more reason to want to get rid of the Metroids. What, you're telling me society would ignore and avoid resolving an emerging danger capable of causing cataclysmic generational death? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and second, personally, I feel this would be a really safe and unambitious choice to put Samus' next big story. It runs the risk of feeling spin-offy just for an excuse to keep Space Pirates and Ridley and Metroids relevant in the game. It's a no from me. No room between Samus Returns and Super, so let's look at the time between Super and Fusion. This is kind of like a prequel to Metroid in story opportunity, but better. Without Metroid and Space Pirates posing active threats, we could finally get more of the bounty hunter angle and focus on smaller stories that don't necessarily need to be connected game to game. But if they are planning more Prime games after 4, this is a little bit of a tight squeeze. And more importantly, we have gotten a story in this part of the canon with Other M. A story after Other M before Fusion might have some merit, but it's still not pulling me in. Then we take a small step over between Fusion and Dread. This is an intriguing but tricky spot. Fusion ends with a ton of tension between Samus and the Federation, having discovered and promptly destroyed their secret scientific operations. A lot of fans wanted to see some payoff for that in Dread, which we didn't really get. I don't really know if there's a whole story in there though. If anything, I think elaborating on this conflict along with other events might be better. That brings us to post Metroid Dread, and I think this is our winner. Looking online, for some reason a lot of people seem to think this is super implausible, whether it's unlikely or just not the right place to host the story. But so much has happened since the other Prime games that I think Prime 4 could really show us a Samus and a galaxy that have drastically changed. I will admit that I don't know how the development of Dread and Prime 4 would have intertwined, how much about the state of the world has been shared between the two, or even if the timelines match up enough to justify this. But I'm hopeful that part of the reason they restarted was to make not only the gameplay, but the story excellent and in line with the progress made by other games. I think a little over a year post Dread would be a fantastic place to pick up. There's no X, no Phazon, and not really any Space Pirates, leaving the door wide open for something totally new. I don't really want there to be much Chozo either. I think Dread was a great send-off to that aspect of Samus' past, and it frequently feels contrived to just have Chozo stuff lying around to justify certain power-ups. And importantly, I want there to be less Federation. They've had a heavy presence throughout Metroid, but I've never really liked the dynamic between them and Samus. It really strips away the whole bounty hunter aspect of her, and makes her feel more like a superhero, a militant kind of figure who's the only one capable of fixing the problem, a hero to all, but someone who can also go against the wishes of those in charge with their moral compass. Starting a story after Dread could leave Samus more isolated than ever, facing brand new threats, and truly introduce us to the world of bounty hunting in this universe. Being uncharted territory, this creates an opportunity to not just design a perfect version of Prime, but change the status quo of the franchise, pushing it forward into new territory. Let's continue to look at Samus's character though, and the benefits of picking up where Dread left off. With a lack of emphasis on Chozo, this gives a pretty good reason to not rip her abilities from her after the tutorial. After all, there wouldn't be a way to get them back. It'd be a lot more immersive to feel like you're really stepping into the next chapter of her story, having come out of the one prior victorious and not set back to square one in contrast to all her experience. Picking up here also offers opportunities for really great characterization. Let's look at Prime 2, Prime 3, Fusion, and Dread. While I wasn't crazy about many aspects of Prime 2, there was a tiny little element I always appreciated. This animation when entering a save point. It feels not exactly tired, but put upon, kind of like, well, I guess I just signed on to save an entire civilization. While I feel this kind of expression is a little out of place in the timeline as a whole, moments like that would fit beautifully in a story set this far into her career. A similar, more in-your-face moment from Prime 3 is after this boss fight, as she struggles with the phase on destroying her from within. This again feels a little misused, I think this coming after a later boss fight would have been better and shown how the situation is getting more dire, but I love what this says. The power-up is right there, she's ready to progress, but she just can't. For a second it's too much, she's seeing her limits, but after a moment she suits up and knows she has to go on. Another great moment and something I'd like to see more of in Prime 4. So how about the 2D games? Fusion is, one of, the Metroid games where we get the most inner monologue, telling us about the situation and about her past and Adam, and also dialogue when she feels she has to speak up. 
While I don't want a fully voiced game again with tons of dialogue, I think establishing a voice to fulfill the role of the introduction and maybe some key thoughts throughout the game would be good. Not unlike Dread. We do get some text dialogue as an intro, we get spare spoken parts to make her feel a little more alive in the world, but primarily Dread shows the story in Samus's facial animation and body language. We see tension, relief, curiosity, and anger in subtle and clear ways. And I don't want this expressiveness to be erased in Prime 4. It'll be a little different different with a shift to first person, but Prime is no stranger to the occasional brief cutscene, so it's not a tall order. There is another aspect of Dread that I want Prime 4 to expand upon. While much of Samus's past has been reduced to memories, the titular Metroids do technically live on, within her DNA. After becoming a Metroid hybrid in Fusion, the DNA begins to activate and take hold throughout Dread. While she already took on their immunities to X and weakness to cold, she also began to gain their parasitic ability, straining energy from machines and living creatures. This culminated in her full transformation with incomparable but untamed power, only resolved by an X neutralizing it for now. But I think that's a Pandora's box that can't be closed, and has a perfect place in the gameplay of this new game. In an effort to understand and control this new power, Samus can begin experimenting with these abilities in controlled bursts. This is the other functionality of your melee attack that I mentioned a while ago. Holding Y after melee to grab onto a target and drain it of energy, converting it into health and additional damage. This may sound a little off base to you, but it actually draws heavily from elements of Prime 3, recontextualized with the plot points of Dread. We have technically seen Samus drain health before using a grapple upgrade. More importantly, we've seen an implementation of a powerful ability that is dangerous left unchecked, being Phazon in the PED suit. Her Metroid abilities may save her in the right situation and enhance her combat, but overuse of the power toes the line of reverting to full Metroid once again, in this case in a much more uncontrollable way. Without mediation, the Metroid DNA will take over her body and corrupt her mind, leaving her as one of the most dangerous entities in the galaxy, and giving you a game over. Samus being the Metroid of the universe is such an interesting concept that I really hope doesn't get hand waved away as resolved with the end of Dread. But with things as they are at this point in time, what forces will Samus be encountering? What life will define the world she travels? Well, for starters, like I said, not the Chozo. But going further into this, I don't want any ancient civilization. They all blend together to me. The Chozo, the Alimbics, the Luminoth, it's all the same. They're all vague, mysterious, noble, and think Samus is a groovy chick. All their ruins and environments are samey to me as well. It's fine if ancient stuff exists on the worlds, but I want things to feel alive and connected to life in the galaxy as a whole, even if Samus is still fundamentally isolated. This leads me into my final point of the story for Prime 4, the element of Metroid I want front and center and something I've already said five times in this video, bounty hunters. So what exactly are bounty hunters in Metroid? Originally called Space Hunters, they're not really one-to-one -one with real-life bounty hunters. They're generally elite fighters who've gained renown with their skills and can be affiliated to some larger group like the Federation or Pirates, but don't have to be. Older descriptions give heavy emphasis on their involvement in fighting space pirates, but I think a lot of people, myself included, view them more as mercenaries. You call them in when you need a tough job done and they make their own way in the galaxy. This connotation makes a lot more sense seeing as hunters are brought in by the Federation to handle super tough missions and not just bring someone or something in for them. The Prime series is the only part of Metroid 2 remotely dive into this part of the universe, and with so many plot threads tied up, it seems like the logical next step. Speaking of, what hunters do we know are out there already and would make sense to return? Rundeskor and Gandreda from Prime 3 are dead, so that leaves us with the Prime Hunters crew. Though they seemingly died to Gorea, at least Silex survived, implying it's possible they all did. A few don't really make sense to come back. Spire was searching for power in his quest to learn about the fate of his race. I guess he could still be kicking around, but his felt like a flimsier backstory to put a fire character in the game. Nox is fighting you always confused the hell out of me. His whole thing is peace and order in the universe, so if he's still up in your grill after saving the universe every other week, he's got some major problems. Kandon's backstory and motivation is fairly simple. He killed his creators and wanted to be the best bounty hunter ever and isn't engaging to me. The other three could be of interest. The two I feel could be relevant to lesser extents are Trace and Weevil. Trace's whole deal was being exiled to find planets for his race to conquer, so either he's kicking around the galaxy as a failure or did find somewhere else in the end. Regardless, the Kraken Empire could be a lesser threat for Samus to deal with. Weevil is another interesting player, a space pirate bounty hunter now without leadership. Him being out there doing the real dirty work, or scrounging up the remaining space pirates, or even leading some small sect of them could be really cool. Unshockingly, pun intended, that brings us to a character most expect or hope to play a key role in Prime 4, Silex. Who is Silex? What does Silex want? 
we don't really know. This is what we do know. Silex is the bounty hunter of unknown origin and identity. We don't even know his gender canonically, but he's been referred to with male pronouns in later interviews. First and foremost, Silex hates the Federation and Samus by association. The by association part of that gets forgotten in discussion frequently. Hell, I didn't really think about it much until this video. He has a ship called the Delano 7 and armor and a weapon that was stolen from the Federation. Silex is also the most emphasized hunter in the Prime games, appearing in post credit scenes of Prime 3, Trailing Samus, and Federation Force hatching a Metroid in Federation captivity. But this is kind of the only issue of the story post Dread is like, what's taking so long? What's he been up to this whole time? Most importantly, what everyone has latched onto for years are interviews talking about the stories to be told about Samus and Silex, all of this mystery and threaded storytelling being in Applied but not elucidated. All we have are theories about who Silex is and what he could possibly be cooking up, mostly split between being a character we know of or something completely new, both with their own merits. The main contender for Silex's secret identity that we know of is Samus's brother Solomon Aaron. Solomon is Samus's younger brother, two years younger than her at the time of the space pirate attack. While their parents were confirmed dead, Solomon was only confirmed missing. He also probably doesn't exist. While this is a somewhat prevalent theory among fans with the family connection and drama it could create, Solomon only appears in a Nintendo Power excerpt about the fan-ridden blood of the Chozo. There's no basis for him in any canon works, and in fact things that actively disprove his existence, such as changing the names of Samus' parents and her age when the space pirates attacked. So that's a no on Solomon. I'm also going to ignore Ian Malkovich, Adam's brother and Samus' old friend who died sacrificing himself. I just don't care. That's that for named characters then, but a lot of the concepts they could bring to the table could apply to new characters, especially considering Silex's hatred for the Federation. Being an ex-Federation soldier or scientist is an easy enough setup, but a little basic and at the time of Prime Hunters, I don't think there's too much reason for a Federation soldier to hate them and Samus enough. The same goes for the concept of an AI clone of Samus created by the Federation. She hadn't really claimed her galactic fame yet, so the Federation wouldn't really have a reason to create a more controllable Samus of their own. Maybe after Fusion though, it's an interesting concept to keep around. At least the concept of failed Federation AI in general. This leads me to my favorite direction for Silex so far. A dark mirror of Samus. No, not like Dark Samus, like, let me explain. For a while, the Federation was just kind of seen as the space police. They were good, doing the right thing to stop the space pirates, and working closely with Samus. Over time, though, we've seen a darker side of the Federation. Encouraging self-sacrifice, copying consciousness into AI that only follows protocol, secretly experimenting on Metroids while pretending they aren't a threat anymore, and wanting to do the same to the X. So what if the Federation was always like this, always had its problems? What if Silex had a similar origin to Samus? Only instead of being orphaned by space pirates, he was orphaned by the Federation. Whether it be an accident or an intentional military strike, the Federation left Silex scared and alone, and he didn't have the Chozo to take him in and make him a great warrior. All he had was himself and his anger. And so over the years, Silex became a feared, ruthless bounty hunter, attacking the Federation whenever possible and stealing their experimental equipment. And when the Metroids became the biggest threat and interest to the Federation, he formed his plan to trail Samus, steal a Metroid, and further experiment on them to bring the Federation down. And credit where credit's due, this was somewhat inspired by Reddit user Jabam's ideas for Silex. I love their concept of a character that challenges what Samus stands for, her sense of right and wrong, and the place for the Federation in the galaxy, making Samus question her own loyalties and sense of purpose. So I think that establishes what I'm looking for in Metroid Prime 4. It takes place after Metroid Dread, with Samus coming to terms with her new Metroid abilities, and being more isolated from the Federation than ever. It's the most alive the galaxy has ever felt, having Samus explore a variety of locations and talking to all sorts of alien races as she picks up bounty hunting jobs. And Silex is the main protagonist, someone who represents what Samus could have been, exposes the darker side of the Federation, and tries to take Samus and the Federation down. And that completes our meal. So with everything finished and in its place, it's time for the final section of this video. My pitch for Metroid Prime 4. That's right, I'm not just here to speculate and talk broadly about the game, I want to give my full-on concept for it. I probably still have time for Retro to see this and fully change their course of development again, right? Anyway, without further ado, here is my Metroid Prime 4. It's been 16 months since the events of Metroid Dread. 
The only living Chozo known to Samus are gone, destroyed on ZDR. The X also perished there, ending the greatest known threat to the galaxy. And lastly, the Metroid are gone, completely eradicated years ago, were it not for Samus. Saved by Metroid DNA that awakened in her battles with Ravenbeak, Samus Aran now lives on as not only the most renowned bounty hunter in the galaxy, but also the last living Metroid. This, along with the first major period of peace in the galaxy in years, have pushed Samus away from the Galactic Federation, who now have less use for her, do not trust her Metroid DNA, and are still unhappy with her destruction of their Metroid experiments and loss of Emmy equipment. We pick up with Samus here, on her own, roaming the galaxy, and picking up jobs from her starship. It's been a while since Samus has been anything but a galactic hero, so it's odd to be back to bounty hunting basics. But, of course, as a game, this might not be basics for every player. After a recap at the beginning of the game like Metroid Dread, you learn the ropes of her arsenal in this new control style as you're dropped right into a short mission. You've been tasked with retrieving a ship log from a crashed space freighter on a planet called EK-7DB. The area is a jagged, rocky desert, and a large portion of the ship has sunken into the sand. By going through the ship to your destination, the game teaches you about your starting equipment, which is, again, your various suit, space jump, power beam and charge beam, missiles, morph ball and bomb, scan visor, and grapple beam. You're trained with these tools through the two main aspects of Metroid, fighting and exploration. Throughout the wreckage, you encounter dangerous native wildlife, keeping things fairly simple but showing a variety of attack styles, be it fast, slow, grounded, or airborne. Exploration also plays a key role. As the ship crashed into the ground, it broke apart and ran through several natural underground caverns. In certain areas of the ship where straightforward progression is no longer possible, you'll have to use your visor and weapons to find alternate routes through the caverns that lead back to the interior of the ship. Eventually, you make your way to the command deck, only to find the entire room being held and ripped apart by a massive creature, its insect-like legs and pincers tearing through the hull. This is your first major boss fight, dodging its attacks and targeting its legs and weak points. Towards the end of the fight, the game introduces your new, controllable Metroid ability, draining health from the creature after countering and returning fire with powerful charged up shots. This demonstrates the destructive power of the move, but also shows the dangers of pushing it too far. At the end, the creature is defeated, leaving space for you to get what you need. However, after you retrieve the log, the ship begins to sink as killing the creature has destabilized the sand, making the ship fall further into the ground. In a miniaturized classic Metroid Escape, you backtrack through the ship in your first test of environmental memory as you break free before the ship is entirely consumed in sand. Having escaped to freedom and completed your mission, you return to your ship and take flight. Upon leaving the planet, you're able to contact your client and transfer the data. They thank you for your help and remark that it appears the ship was attacked and some Federation goods might be missing. Might have just been destroyed in the crash, though. After ending the call, you get a rundown of the basics of your ship. How to view the galactic map, finding new bounties and missions to take, manual flight and weapon controls, and more extraneous and situational things like the ship's heavy-duty grapple, vital check, and equipment expansion log. From this point, the game becomes more open-ended as various missions become available at the same time, inspired by Prime Hunters, Prime 3, and to some extent Star Wars games like Jedi Academy or Fallen Order. These missions are more or less self-contained Metroidvania levels, long enough to encourage finding secrets and exploring, but short enough to not keep you in one place for the whole game, though certain specific instances would have you return to planets to explore further. But we'll get there when we get there. After the tutorial, you have three missions to complete in any order. Spread throughout are key unlocks and basic enhancements like missile expansions and energy tanks. One of these takes place on a planet called Ganora, deep in one of its many jungles. A research team has lost contact with one of its bases and wants you to go and investigate. Shortly into your exploration, you realize this was not a freak accident or encounter with dangerous wildlife. As you wander the area, you're attacked by a renegade space pirate troop still hiding out after all these years. This mission is heavy on combat, potentially putting you against your first real intelligent foes. As such, your main unlock from this mission is the Wave Beam, allowing you to shoot through certain energy shields and dense foliage. After battling through their numbers and defeating some tougher pirate variants, you discover some surviving captives from the research team, and the crew takes their leave to report back, allowing you time to explore areas you've missed before returning to your own ship. Another mission switches gears to an escort job. A diplomat visiting a large base in the snowy planet of Zaro has had a bounty put on him and needs help getting to a safe landing area for his team's ship to pick him up. As you begin exploring the facility, you're attacked from somewhere you can't quite place by imperialist sniper shots. 
As it turns out, Trace survived the events of Prime Hunters, and has been doing his own bounty hunter work after being shunned by his race for failing to find the ultimate weapon. This not only reintroduces Samus to the idea of those specific other hunters being around, but also creates a dangerous game of cat and mouse, making you move carefully between buildings and areas Trace can't shoot. After some further searching of the facility, you're able to meet up with the diplomat and begin to escort him out. Certain sections would require you to break up and reconvene, establishing quicker routes he can move through, and making sure you're not stuck with the CPU who can't do what you do the entire time, to give you time to explore. This mission has some combat, of course, but would be heavily focused on your use of your visor, calling your ship to move some objects for easier traversal and blocking trace fire. You also discover a new visor in the X-ray visor, further helping you find your path forward and battle the invisible trace, and the Plasma Beam, a slow but long-ranged and deadly beam. With this new gear, you're able to shoot out with Trace long enough to run him off and get the Diplomat out safely. The final of the three starter missions takes place in the forest and mountains of 24SO9. This actually comes from the Federation, who show a little hesitance to work with you, but understand that the situation calls for it. The power plant of an experimental facility has been compromised during an attack from an unknown assailant. The crew there has either escaped or been killed, but with the reactor malfunctioning, someone needs to go and fix it before all of their technology and work is destroyed. Before the mission proper begins, you have your first experience with manual control over your ship, guiding it through a dangerous asteroid field in order to get to the planet. These ship interludes only happen every so often, but help give you a feel for the ship as it will come more into play later. Having successfully navigated the field, you arrive at your destination. While the first two missions were more action-oriented, this one is highly explorative and focuses on isolation. While the area is a mountainous forest, the majority of the mission is in this highly technological base, with certain areas extremely dark due to lack of proper power flow. Other areas are covered in dangerous radioactive clouds, too dense for your suit to handle at first. This mission features extensive use of the Morph Ball to navigate narrow passageways, and use of your scan visor will begin to give you some idea of what might be going on in this game, hinting at the identity of the assailant without giving too much away. Signs of struggle, burn marks due to high electrical voltage on the walls, missing weaponry, things like that. To amplify this, you unlock two new items here, the Spring Ball and the Shield Unit. The Spring Ball provides your Morph Ball with a jump, helping you get to tougher to reach areas. The Shield Unit surrounds your suit with an energy shield, adding additional defense and nullifying dangerous environmental hazards while pulling from your suit's movement, meaning you're a little slower but able to take a lot more damage. With these, you're able to push into the deepest parts of the facility, defeat creatures that were being studied and experimented on that have broken free, and solve a Morph Ball focused puzzle that neutralizes and reroutes the reactor. Having completed these, two more missions become available, both slightly longer form than the first three. You'll also be able to backtrack wherever needed in case you're able to use new unlocks there. The first is a follow-up contract from the Ganora research team. They were able to identify where the pirates might be holding up, and claim that others have spotted a pirate bounty hunter leading the faction, Weevil. They'd like you to go and do some good old-fashioned space pirate hunting so the area can be safe again. Returning to Ganora, you explore the area even further. You eventually uncover the space pirate base, fighting your way through and discovering another expansion to your arsenal, the Super Missile. I'd love for there to be some of Prime's great pirate logs here, maybe even further hinting at the rogue element attacking the Federation, either doing business with them or being at odds. Eventually, you find Weevil in the central operating room of the base, battle against him and his crew, and seize the day turning over surviving pirates to the Federation. The fifth mission takes things back to more of a classic Metroid Prime vibe, focusing on a ruined temple on the fiery planet Krylon. A giant beast has taken hold in a temple and has dug into the surrounding volcano even further, threatening to break it apart and destroy nearby villages. But before your fifth mission, whether it be on Ganora or Krylon, another ship interlude occurs this time a dogfight. Trace is none too happy about you interfering with his plans again, and is out to end you once and for all. This takes place around a set of small moons, giving you room to avoid fire and turn around to fight back. Using the heavy cannon and ship missiles, you pilot for your life and defeat Trace for the last time. Resuming your mission, this is another exploration-heavy mission, finding the best way through the temple to reach the monster. Within the temple, you'll find two more powerful power-ups, ice missiles and the cross bomb. Both have tons of combat advantage, obviously, but would particularly help you progress here, bombing across unstable pathways and freezing lava flows like in other Metroid games. Soon enough, you find your target, a massive winged lizard, and use all your tools so far to defeat it, seal cracks in the walls of the volcano, and avoid catastrophe. At this point, you should be pretty well versed with the new standards of this game and the core tenets of the experience. A single new mission appears this time, a vague distress beacon from above the planet QM4E. You fly over, but on your descent, something goes wrong. Your ship controls malfunction as you pass through a storm, and you're left plummeting down until you crash into a violent ocean, losing consciousness. 
See, the problem is this is a twist that works better if you just experience it. So if Prime 4 is really anything like this, I'm sorry I've spoiled it for you. My idea for Prime 4 is built around this turn of events. While in the first third of the game you're jumping around from planet to planet, the rest of the game returns to grounded Metroid Prime roots and isolates you on one planet. The first chunk of the game would more or less be training for everything else to come. Stuck on the unfamiliar and hostile QM4E, it's up to you to uncover what's going on, figure out who's behind everything, and get out of here. Unfortunately, from here on out, I'm less able to get into specifics. While the initial portion of the game is segmented enough to have distinct personalities and concepts, as the story kicks in, there's kind of less to say besides broader concepts. Furthermore, I guess I could full-on design the game and talk about combat encounters and puzzles and unlocks, stuff like that, but let's be real. You're not here for that. So the rest of my pitch will be covering the general flow of the campaign, a couple key events, and the basic points of the story. Sometime after the crash, you awaken in a containment pod in your Zero Suit. After kicking the door out to escape, you find yourself in a strange facility that oddly looks like an old Federation build. You soon encounter a hefty robotic guard patrolling the area. With a nearby tool, you take him down and rip its arm cannon off to use for yourself. This short section of the game has you seeking out your stolen Varius suit, with basically no health and a semi-functional arm cannon offering a very slow, strong blast as a last resort. This would probably be the tensest section of the game, taking on much more of a horror vibe with the lurching mechanical enemies. It wouldn't be exceedingly drug out though, and soon enough you'll find your Varius suit locked away in a containment room. Equipped with your weaponry and visors once again, you can now start exploring the facility properly and deciphering the situation. As you move on, you eventually stumble into some sort of lab, mostly dark as you enter. Then an all too familiar green glow emanates from the shadows and electricity lashes out at you. Bathed in darkness, this is your reunion with Silex and your first battle against him. After beating him once again in a fight similar to Prime Hunters, you get a better look at him in the light of the flames now illuminating the room. Then, Silex angrily speaks out at you. Whether this is through text or fully voiced, I'll leave that up to them. You were never meant to come here, not meant to ruin another chance to make the Federation pay. You can't leave this planet, but Silex knows he can't defeat you right now, especially with Metroid DNA on your side. Before escaping, Silex slams on a nearby control console. At first, just barely visible, specimen pods light up, revealing terrifying new creatures that awaken and burst out from their containment. A scan reveals the first example of Silex's work. After stealing a Metroid from the Federation, Silex has been experimenting and creating new breeds of Metroid, more adaptable and deadlier than ever. Ice missiles may slow them down, but they have been so genetically twisted that it is no longer their core weakness. Once you strike these new monsters down, it's back to your journey to figure out what's going on and to escape. This encounter sets the rest of the story and game in motion. For a while, you wander around on foot, occasionally finding teleporters and elevators that will bring you to different sections of this main facility. In what glances and outdoor sections you get of this planet, you can see that it seems trapped in eternal storm, a mix of treacherous mountains and roaring oceans. Some sections of the base are completely submerged, making the main areas of play being the facility, rocky caverns, and underwater. Its blue aesthetic really seals the feeling of being trapped in Silex's world. On top of everything else, QM4E will also be throwing some dangerous wildlife at you to keep you on your toes. However, while dangerous, these will not be your main causes for concern. You encounter more and more new Metroid variants, in forms you've never seen before with enhanced speed and strength, somewhat harkening back to Samus Returns. In essence, these are the justifiers for the Metroid Prime title, thought of as a rebirth of the Metroid threat. Scanning will give plenty of helpful combat hints and some insight as to what created each type. Scanning also comes heavily into play with the base and the robotic enemies. With it, you can discover that this was a very old Federation base housing several dangerous and rejected projects. The entire base has been distorted, its systems completely hacked into Silex's violent vision, allowing his scheming and experimentation. Still, the fact that much of this only exists because of the Federation and what they could have intended to do with it is troubling. Finally, through scoured Federation servers and research logs, you'll be able to learn more about Silex. Reasonably, you wouldn't be able to divulge a whole life story, but more or less what I've already stated. Silex was orphaned as a boy due to an overzealous Federation orbital strike against nearby space pirates. At that point, Silex dedicated his life to attacking the Federation at every turn, trying to sabotage them and get his revenge. He also gained a specific hatred for bounty hunters working for the Federation, believing them to not realize that the Federation is treating them as expendable to do the dirty jobs their ill-trained soldiers can't. In particular, Silex sees Samus as the same destructive the force that led him down this path, with several entire planets destroyed now in the name of her mission. While you're not able to make out Silex's exact plans for the new Metroids, all of this brings a lot of interesting things front and center, making Samus question the Federation and her role in their goals even more than before, while still knowing that Silex can't be allowed to do what he plans to. 
Eventually, you're able to scan an info hub that helps you locate your ship, left on the shore where you crashed and washed up. It's taken damage, but still seems fairly functional. The ship's AI takes an assessment of the situation and believes escape is not an option at this time. The area around the facility is heavily guarded by aerial defenses, and any attempt to fly away would surely be met by opposition the ship could not face at this time. However, you should be able to fly low enough to avoid detection and explore farther sections of the base. You're able to locate a network station where your ship can run a fuller diagnostic. With this, you now have three primary forms of transportation. On foot, using teleporters and elevators within one section of the facility, and using your ship to reach formerly off-limits areas. Once here, your AI determines that the facility's systems are not controlled directly by Silex in one place, but rather by an AI hive mind with several parts around the facility. For this, I pulled from an unused concept for the Prime series, unofficially called the Mad AI. Originally, these were four AI personalities that would challenge Samus in different ways, basically for sport. These four were the Child, Mother, Martyr, and Killer, and I decided it would be cool to see that premise played with in Prime 4. These four personalities are also kind of reminiscent of different parts of Samus' identity, which I also think is a neat touch. Just like everything else here, these were AI designed by the Federation that malfunctioned and went haywire, becoming too dangerous and unable to complete their task. Silex has reawakened the AI and put them in charge of aspects of the base. The child is in charge of the physical structures and paths of the base. The mother is in charge of the life systems of the biological experiments. The killer is a hulking mobile droid that roams the facility while also monitoring the whole base. And the martyr is the central director, ensuring everything stays on course according to the prime directive. Though unable to locate the martyr system, you are able to locate the central units of the other three, which become focal points for your mission to be completed in any order allowed by unlocks. It kind of has the vibe of the Divine Beast in Breath of the Wild. Your ship AI calculates that taking this hive mind offline should be enough to halt further Metroid experimentation and allow you a window for escape. This is really one of the last major story beats I have planned, as the rest would be gameplay driven as you learn more about Silex's plans and the Federation's CD past and make your way to the AIs. You'll encounter some other bosses along the way, whether they be Federation constructs or native creatures either underwater or on the surface of the planet, both of which you'll occasionally need to move through. These will be your main ways for further unlocking your arsenal. I think on top of things like missiles and health, you would also find experimental units that would allow you to channel more of your Metroid energy without going too far. I also think one key room you'll see but not fully understand is a large-scale teleporter room, seemingly set up to automatically fire up upon some unknown condition. The room is filled with sealed, impenetrable crates. Beyond that, you're really just getting to the AIs and taking them down in their own unique gauntlets. The child AI, as originally designed, is basically a huge puzzle, using your mobility and accuracy to navigate a treacherous, changing room and align various pieces to attack the core. The mother is a machine built around the original stolen Metroid. A scan shows the Metroid itself is long dead but basically in a recycled stasis to use for the new Metroids. This would be a wave-based battle, fighting various types of Metroid and a few unique bosses, until the point where Mother short circuits and cannot perform the task anymore. Finally, the killer can either be found or find you, as it will be roaming the halls. You better hope it doesn't find you when you're not ready, as this is the single toughest enemy in the game. This is a true test of your one-on-one -on -one combat skills, with it dealing massive damage and taking plenty. Once you've completed the majority of the game and destroyed the AIs, you're able to locate the Martyr. This entire sequence is basically a long stretch as the finale of the game. Arriving at the Martyr's core, you see that Silex has actually merged the AI into an enhanced version of his suit, powering him up and driving him a little more crazy than before. I like the concept of Silex becoming one with a Federation AI, something he sees as his enemy in the same way Samus merged with the Metroid. This would be a big, multi-phase boss fight with Silex throwing absolutely everything he can at you. His own attacks, new Metroids, robots, turrets, everything. A later section will have the ceiling open up and call in his ship for backup. With enough skill, you're able to take him down and you draw your hand back to use your Metroid abilities to finish him. However, something gives you pause with everything you've learned about him in the Federation. You leave him there and sever the connection to the Martyr, destroying it. This sets the facility into a full meltdown, and it's time for a classic Metroid escape finale. This not only involves backtracking through a large portion of the facility, but also manually getting into your ship and piloting yourself out of there in the most intense Metroid escape yet. On the way out, some remaining perimeter drones still try to take you down. At last, you're able to break away and leave the planet, seeing a small explosion on its surface. You're not sure what became of Silex, and you're not sure if you've actually stopped his plan or if he had contingencies. 
maybe it had something to do with that teleporter room we saw. I don't know, I'm just making the game. This campaign and ending sets up a lot of potential consequences for future installments. Silex could still be out there, and his plan could unfold further and further after escaping with backup Metroid experiments. If you really wanted to go crazy, Metroid Prime 5 could start to shift things and have Silex become more sympathetic, ultimately having you work with him and making the Federation the main enemy of Prime 6. But that's getting way ahead of ourselves, and for now, you've concluded your journey in Metroid Prime 4. That is, unless you want to play some multiplayer. That's right, I'm not done just yet. While the single player is obviously the most important part of Prime 4 for them to get right, I really want them to bring some multiplayer modes back into the fold. I had a blast playing Prime Hunters multiplayer, and I enjoyed what little of Prime 2's multiplayer I did play, and with shooters as big as ever, I think it would be a great addition. The main way multiplayer would work here would be to take inspiration from Prime Hunters and class-based hero shooters, with a roster of unique playable characters, each with different skills and special weapons. This allows you to draw from characters throughout the Metroid franchise as well, not just this game. You could have Samus and Silex, the other Hunters from Prime Hunters, the Hunters from Prime 3, Dark Samus, a Federation Trooper, a Space Pirate, one of the Robot Guard types from this campaign, maybe even things outside of Prime like the SAX and Ravenbeak. Honestly, if you just did some basic game modes from other shooters like Hunters did, it would already be great. A basic battle and survival mode with team variants, Prime Hunter as a Juggernaut mode, Capture and King of the Hill, things like that. Maybe even variants with CPU enemies in sort of a free-for-all horde or firefight survival mode. I'd really like more experimental concepts that play into the bounty hunter persona, but I'm not expecting too much. Still, things like a 3v1 asymmetrical mode with one player controlling a boss like an Omega Pirate, or small missions or challenges to take on solo or as a team similar to Federation Force or Modern Warfare 2 Spec Ops missions would be awesome. And with that, now I'm actually done with my take on Metroid Prime 4. And I am fully ready and accepting that the real thing will be nothing like this. Sure, there are some key things here that I'd really like them to keep. Taking place after Dread, keeping the major changes that have occurred, establishing Silex as the main antagonist and a dark reflection of Samus, more emphasis on Samus as a bounty hunter separate of the Federation, controlling the ship, multiplayer, the core stuff like that. But I have a good amount of confidence for Retro to make a great game, so as long as the controls are modernized and it tells an interesting story, and it combines the best element of the Prime games, then I'll be happy no matter what. I guess now it's back to waiting for that long-awaited update to see the real deal. Be sure to like and subscribe, and tell me what you thought about this in the comments. I've had this idea for a while, and I would love to do more, because it's really fun to break a franchise down and try to imagine the next installment. I'm considering doing one for Pikmin 4, but with less emphasis on the me pitching a whole idea thing, so if that's something you're interested in, let me know. Big thank you to Morgan and Jamie for helping out with the artwork, they did an amazing job. And if you're interested in what I cooked, go check out the comments, it's an actual recipe made by somebody who makes really cool ones based off of Smash characters. And stay tuned for way more coming out soon. I've been extremely busy with multiple projects and the next one out should finally be my first full-length album. So until next time, thanks for watching.